key of uh, teaching in context is everything gets addressed, and it gets addressed in the context in which it was given. So we're going to finish it out. We pretty much worked through this the whole summer, and uh, we're going we're gonna to finish chapter 6 now. So we're going to jump in. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 1, I'm going to read a little bit of context, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive into some teaching. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, I just want to that's just want to kind of jump in that for just a moment, uh, and let's take a look at it. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself also lest you be tempted. Now, here's the thing. Um, God's intention in the body of Christ is always restoration. Uh, But unfortunately, what what can happen a lot of times in Christianity is when someone fails or someone falls, um, rather than helping that individual, what can happen is people can kind of rally around that person and condemn them and judge them. And, um, and, And certainly, you know, there is a clear... Uh, place of what's right, and there's a clear place of what's wrong, but the intention of the body of Christ is to help heal its body, um, not to necessarily cut it off. You know, if I have hurt my finger uh, and my finger gets hurt, you know, I'm not going to immediately just cut my finger off. What I'm going to look to do is I'm going to look to heal my finger and restore my finger. And this is what this is talking about is someone is overtaken in a trespass. What does that mean? Somebody falls into sin, somebody falls into making some mistakes, somebody falls into doing some dumb stuff. Um, the, the mindset of God is let's, let's restore this person, let's help this person, let's help this person heal. How I many you know we don't come to church because we're perfect? We come to church because we need Jesus. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, you know, church is not a place where we're, you know, all perfect trophies in a trophy case. We come here because we have problems and we need help and we need healing and we need each other. And so, um, the, and, and unfortunately, in a legalistic atmosphere, what can happen when somebody falls, um, you know, it's kind of this atmosphere of condemn or be condemned. It, that can be the atmosphere in a, in a church setting. You know, if someone makes a mistake and falls, and everyone immediately begins to condemn that individual, begins to point at that individual, condemn that individual, and, and rather than this person being restored, rather than this person receiving healing, what ends up happening is this person gets completely cut off from the body and they don't have an opportunity um, to be restored to, to, to their calling, to be restored um, to their identity. And so church should be a place of restoration. It should not be a place of rejection. Now, um, there are instances in New Testament Christianity where you know people are corrected and they don't get it right, and then those people are asked to be removed from the fellowship as a result of them refusing you know, to make a change. We see that in, in the book of Corinthians. There was an example where a man was sleeping with his, um, uh, I guess, I guess his, his father's wife and stepmother, you know. And, um, you know, that, of course, we know that's wrong. We know that's an example of immorality. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians, uh, addressed that and said, look, this is wrong. We can't do that. I mean, you know, just because we're forgiven doesn't mean everything's okay. Can I get an Amen. And, uh, and so Paul said, look, we've got to address this situation. What this individual is doing is wrong. But what happened was the individual received correction, said, look, I recognize that I messed up, you know, apologized, repented. And then in the second letter of the book of Corinthians, Paul is trying to talk them into restoring this guy, bringing him back into fellowship. See, it's one thing to have a problem and struggle with that problem. It's another thing to take something that's wrong and declare that it's right. Because in one instance, you're dealing with pride and you're dealing with someone who's just refusing correction. In another instance, you're dealing with someone who has a weakness and they have a problem and they're like, look, I'm struggling with this. I need help. Those are two completely different situations. In one situation, someone's pridefully saying, what I'm doing, there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. I received, re- refuse to receive correction. And how I many you know the only thing that frustrates grace really is pride? And if I pridefully declare that I'm not going to change, I'm doing nothing wrong, I'm going to continue down this road that I'm going, even though it's hurting me and hurting those around me, how many know there's a place for correction in the body concerning that? That individual needs to be um, addressed you know, individually and then with the elders of the church. And then if they refuse uh, to make a change and they decide to continue to go down a self-destructive path that hurts them and those around them, that person is asked to be removed. But 
this, and so that's, that's a legitimate thing. That's, that's a part of the body of Christ. But this situation is someone who's fallen into something. They've made a mistake. I mean, you know, God's heart is always redemption. God's heart is always restoration. God, God knows, because here's the reality, folks. How I many you know you have an enemy who's going about seeking whom he may devour, uh, he has a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the enemy is, of course, going to try to trip people up, going to try to tempt people, going to try to bring people into things that are going to hurt them. And we, as the body, when someone falls, um, they need help. Now, and we want to help them. We want to restore them. We want to preach the gospel to them. We want to tell them how much God loves them and that God is for them. Because here's the reality. I mean, you know, even when you fail, even when you fall, I mean, you know, God's still for you. You don't have anybody in your life that's more for you than God is. You know, God is not this type of God that where when you fail and when you fall, all of a sudden God's not on your team anymore. God's not on your side and He just forsakes you. I mean, well, that's not scriptural. The Bible says He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And so when you are at your worst day, when you're at your worst moment, you can count on God to still be there for you. Now, you may not be able to count on all Christians to still be there for you. How I many know Christians have their ins and outs, and sometimes they can get judgmental and condemning. But the reality is, is God is for you, and God's intention is to raise up somebody who will stand with you and love you through this fall, love you through this failure. And that's why in this passage it says, ye which are spiritual. There is an element of spirituality and maturity that needs to be present in order for restoration to take place. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. What does that mean? I've seen my brother, he's fallen here. Out of a place of being spiritual, I'm not going to know him according to the flesh. I'm going to look past his failure. I'm going to look past his sin, look past his mistake, and make a decision to believe the best about this person. I'm going to make a decision to see Christ in them. I'm going to speak to the Christ in them. And I'm going to say, look, you made that mistake. You may have fallen into that sin, but this failure does not define you. This is not who you are. You are better than this. And that's why even when Paul addressed the Corinthian church and was correcting them in their immorality, in the beginning of the letter, he addressed them as saints. He addressed them as saints. And then he went on to say, Know ye not that you are the temple of the living God. How I many you know just because somebody makes a mistake does not mean that they now cease to be a Christian? Just because someone makes a mistake does not mean that they're going to cease to be a son of God or cease to be a daughter of God. How I many you know they're still in the body? They're still a child of God, but we need someone who's spiritual enough to look past their failure, love them, take love, and let love cover a multitude of sin, speak life to this person, and restore them in the spirit of gentleness. What does that mean? That means I'm not coming to them, condemning them, or making them feel bad about themselves out of a place of gentleness. What does that mean? Gentleness. Gentleness. I'm going to, you know, I, I remember I was a part of a restoration of a pastor um, who had fallen and uh, I had an opportunity to counsel uh, his life and to be in his life and to kind of help him through it. And as I began to, to step forth into that situation, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, treat him exactly the way you would want to be treated. And how I many know that kind of settles a lot of the arguments there? Like, you know, because how I many know we, we all periodically need help? And, what, and, and, and the challenging thing about condemnation is it can set me up into a position where if I see somebody fall, rather than helping them, I'm going to justify myself by condemning them so I can feel better about my own failure. I mean, you know, that's actually not spirituality. That's actually fleshliness. That's carnality. Uh, but when there's an absence of grace or graciousness, uh, what happens is when people fall, it's like... Uh, you know, it's like blood in the water, and it becomes this feeding frenzy of condemnation. The Bible says, take heed lest ye devour each other and devour one another. And this has been many times the pattern in the body of Christ, but it's not here in Scripture. God says, if you're spiritual, in a spirit of gentleness, restore this person that's fallen, because how I many you know God's heart is redemption, God's heart is restoration, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's why Jesus died on the cross for us, because God wanted to restore us into a place of fellowship with Him. And so this is God's heartbeat. This is God's will. And so if you have an opportunity to come along somebody... Now, how many of you know if this individual... Sit, you know, let's say, for example, this person's sleeping with somebody's wife, okay? And say it's in the church. It's not happening in this church. But let's say that it was happening. And this person, they're committing adultery. And this guy's saying, look, you know, I don't care. 
I'm forgiven. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. God still loves me. God's still for me. And this person continues in that behavior. How many know this is, that's a different scenario? This person is refusing in a state of pride to even acknowledge what they're doing is wrong. The type of correction that's going to come to this guy is different than someone says, you know what? I've fallen. I've made a mistake. I need help. That person needs restoration. The other person dealing with that pride and declaring the wrong that they're doing is right. I mean, Jesus, you know, Paul said, look, like when he was referencing one of his disciples, that I've delivered them over to Satan for the destruction of their flesh. I mean, you know, sometimes it's mercy to, re- to reap bad consequences so that you can learn from your mistakes. And there, are, and there are times when pride is present, and that's something that happens. The school of hard knocks is not the best school to go to, but at the same time, it still delivers the point. And so what, I, what I'm saying here is this individual that we're referencing, going through something, made a fall, needs to be restored. You that are spiritual, restore them in the spirit of gentleness, and the spirit of meekness. And then it goes on to say, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. And so there's this element of, and, and one of the things about when someone has fallen many times or made a mistake, how many know it's easy for people to get offended? And a lot of times what will happen is when someone's fallen into something like that, how many people can get offended at the church? And then the, the challenging thing about offense is offense is a breeding ground for more offense. When, you, when you're dealing with one person that's offended, a lot of times their offense will try to get over on you, and then now you're offended with the same offense that they were offended with, and it becomes this canker sore. It becomes this horrible disease that starts to um, turn people's hearts away from a church, turn people's hearts away from a place of leadership, because this offense is present. I think one of the most dangerous things that we deal with in society is offense. And uh, you have to be careful, uh, because it, how many know it's easy to get offended? Because there's a lot of dumb stuff that's going on in the world today. There's a lot of injustice that's happening. It's easy to be offended uh, towards people, easy to be offended towards government, easy to be offended towards church, towards God, all of these things. But Jesus, when he died on the cross, actually ended all arguments of offense. Because when Jesus, I mean, know that Jesus did not deserve anything that he received on the cross. If you look at what he deserved, he didn't deserve it. I mean, he didn't deserve to be whipped. He didn't deserve to be beaten. He didn't deserve to have his beard plucked out. He didn't deserve to be crucified. He never sinned. He never transgressed. But Jesus on the cross took the punishment for all of our offense, all of our sin, all of our shame. I mean, oh, the cross was one of the most unequal, equally balanced judging fields that has ever been. He took upon himself what we deserved so that he could give us what he deserved, which is his righteousness. And so when you understand that, when you recognize what he went through and you receive that forgiveness, I mean, I stand before you today, I was a drug addict, alcoholic, atheist, lying, cheating, womanizing, depressed, horrible fool, and God came into my life and forgave me. I mean, I didn't deserve any of that, but now that forgiveness that he's given to me, now how many know now I now have the ability to forgive people that don't deserve it because I received the forgiveness that I did not deserve. So all the people that have hurt me, all the people that have used me, I now extend in a forgiveness to them. Why? I actually no longer carry the right to be offended. I, I no longer carry the right to hold offense. I mean, a part of being a Christian is relinquishing your right to hold unforgiveness. <laughs> you just aren't allowed to do it anymore. Now, you can if you want to. But the challenge about doing that is uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave you in a state of misery. One of the worst things you can do is walk around holding unforgiveness. Uh, Because if you do that, it's going to impact your heart and your peace. How many know if you live offended, you're going to live angry? And how many know if you live angry, you're not going to be happy? And you're not going to have peace? The greatest thing you can do is forgive those that hurt you and used you so that you can set yourself free from allowing them to continue to hurt you in the future. And I'm not saying everything that's happened to us is right. I'm not saying everything that's happened to us was uh, the right thing to do. But I am telling you this right now, forgiving those that hurt you and abuse you and come against you, that is the right thing to do because you will set yourself free and you can live in a state of peace. But the enemy is always trying to bring people back into a state of offense so that they'll be angry with the world and they'll live in a state of anger. And we have 
this race angry with this race, and this political party angry with this political party, and, these, and this, this church angry with this church, and everybody's offended, everybody's angry, and division becomes the rule of the day. Now, how many know the enemy knows that if a house divided cannot stand? And so what, one of the greatest tools and elements that he uses to bring division is offense. So he, people live in a state of offense. You know, I had, to, I had, I had a, a season in my life where I got really invested in the news and in politics, and what ended up happening to me is I was living mad. <laughs> and I stayed mad all the time. And you know what I did? I gathered around other mad people. And we were all mad, and we were all offended, and all we did was complain, and all we did was... And you know what it did? It robbed me of the quality of my life. See, no one should have the right to take peace from you. I mean, you have to, you have to, you know, Jesus has already given us his peace. We've been talking, this has kind of been a theme, we've been talking about this a lot, talking about this in Bible study last week. Jesus gave you his peace, okay? So you don't have to conjure up peace, you don't have to try to get peace, you have peace. But the enemy doesn't want you living in a state of peace, because he does not know how to handle a peaceful Christian. And so what he's going to try to do is he's going to try to rob you of peace through someone else's wrongdoing, through someone else's offense, and bring your heart into a state of unforgiveness, bring your heart into a state of offense to where now your default setting is you're living angry. And if you're living in a state of anger, your loved ones will be the beneficiary. So you may be angry at something that's going on in the world today, but if you're carrying that anger and that offense, it ends up seeping over into your home life, seeping over into your children, your marriage, your workplace... I mean, no, we don't need that. Our kingdom is not a king, kingdom of anger and offense. Our kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. The Bible says, we let not our hearts be troubled, neither do we let it be afraid. You live in a state of peace. Now, that doesn't mean that we roll over uh, when we see injustice in the world. doesn't mean that we roll over and say, ah, I'm just going to go with the punches, I'm just going to go with the float. No. How many know we are called to take a stand for what is right and what is true? Okay, get an amen. But at the same time, what you don't want to do is to allow this world's offense and division and unforgiveness to invade your heart and bring you into a state of oppression and even depression as a result of the wrong that's been done to you. How many know that what was done to Jesus is more wrong than anything that's ever been done to any of us? And if He can, on the cross, say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If He can, by the grace of God, extend the forgiveness to those that came against Him, how many know that same Jesus lives on the inside of you, and He's empowered you to give that same forgiveness that you have received to other people to keep you and me free from offense. So we can live in peace in a fallen world. And so... In this passage where he's talking about you which are spiritual, restore one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted, it's that snare of offense. And that word offense is the word scandalion in the Greek, and it literally means a trap. It literally means a snare. The enemy's always trying to get you offended at something so you can live angry. I would encourage you, walk around his trap. Don't live in offense. Don't live in anger. Forgive those that hurt you, and you will keep yourself free. And keep your heart in a state of peace. Amen? And so he goes on to say in verse 2, um, it says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now this is the, the very nature, this is the law of Christ, which is a very interesting statement. The law of Christ. That word Christ means the anointing, and, his, and, the, and the anointed one in His anointing, the law of Christ. As a Christian, your calling is to bear the burdens um, of those around you. Um, your, your calling, how many you know as a Christian, you're not called to use your strength to oppress those that are weaker than you? As a Christian, if you have strength, you're, you're called to use your strength to bear the burdens of those around you and to help people around you. And what this is, this is talking about living for something other than yourself. In our society, in our modern day culture, there's a real strain of selfishness. You know, it's all about me, it's all about my happiness, it's all about you know, what I do, what I can be. I think social media really can, can um, encourage this type of attitude and, and what can happen in the name of me and even, even in, under the name of self-love, we can begin to, and I'm not again, you need to love yourself with the love of God. That's a very healthy thing to do. 
But selfishness, no matter what form it takes or hashtag you place on it, selfishness will leave you miserable. It's just, it's just the lie of the world to think that if I just live for me and I take and I take and I take, I'm going to be happy. No, over and over again it's been proved. You are not designed to live for yourself. Your, your Creator designed you um, differently than that. And, you know, and I quote this a lot, but there was a, a famous rock star uh, who had the accolade of his peers and of the, of, the, uh, of the people, and everyone just thought he was amazing, and he made this statement. He said, you do not know what true misery is until you have everything that you've ever wanted and you're still miserable. Why is that? I mean, Hollywood has proven to us that just having money and wealth and riches and looks does not mean happiness. Because at the root, at the end of the day, you're called to live for something other than yourself. You know who are the happy people in the world? The people that are loving. The people that are being loved and loving, those are the happy people. And, and uh, it doesn't matter the abundance of things that you have. It doesn't matter the degrees behind your name. The happy people are the people that have, you know, Jesus told his disciples, and he gave them an example of leadership, and he walked around and he washed their feet. And he says, happy are you if you do this. <laughs> what was he saying? Happiness is really based in serving and loving and bearing one another's burdens. But the enemy's always trying to dangle that carrot in front of us of selfishness. Is what you need is some more you time. What you need is some more things for you, some more stuff for you, for you, for you, for you. And then even as Christians, we can take that bait and there we are miserable because there's a love dam that's been set up in our heart. How I many you know love from the Father never stops? God's love for you is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. God loves you. He is love. That's what He does. But how many know that we can, through selfishness and starting to lean on carnality in the flesh, how many we can stop that love from going through us and we can begin to kind of set up camp and just live for ourselves? And I promise you, no matter how many cool TV shows you watch or how many YouTube videos you click on or how much pizza you eat or whatever you consume... It will not bring you joy. At the end of the day, it brings a sense of emptiness. And, but, and why? Because we're called to live for something other than ourselves. And that's what this passage is saying. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What does that mean? We're given the anointing, we're given the Spirit of God to bear the burdens of those around us to be a blessing and to help people to live for something other than ourselves. Uh, verse 3, it says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he alone will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. So what is this talking about? This is bringing forth the reality, for if each one thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Here, here's, here's the absolute truth. There's nobody in this room this morning that's any better than anybody else. Okay? And, and, and this concept of one person being better, or one person being more righteous, or one person being, uh, you know, somehow having more of God or more of Jesus, it's just not true. When Jesus moved inside of you, He brought all of Himself with you. And, I mean, you know, just because I'm a preacher doesn't mean I have more of a right to God than anybody else. We're in the family. We've been made the righteousness of God as a gift. And we cannot, when I start to think of myself as more highly than I ought to think, how I many you know if I think that I'm better than somebody else, it's going to be difficult for me to walk in love towards that person? Condemnation and love don't mix. Pride is the opposite of love. If you look at 1 Corinthians 13, the opposite ends of the spectrum on the description of what love is, you have pride on one end and you have love on the other end. And so what this is saying, if you think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. One of the greatest deceptions that can face anybody is the concept of pride. If you think that you're better than somebody else, if you think that somehow because of what you have or what you do or the way you look or whatever sets you up as being better than somebody else, there's a deception here that's taking place. And if there's anything that frustrates grace, it's pride. And so what he's, he's addressing here um, is that issue of not thinking yourself to be better than somebody else, not thinking that you're something that you're not, but at the same time, uh, not, not degrading yourself, not being lowly on yourself. How I many know you can have a confidence that does not belittle other people? A godly confidence, and confidence is very good. I think the church really needs confidence. And I think 
It's a huge thing that the church needs. I think the gospel will bring that to people. But when you have a godly confidence, when you stand around someone else, you're actually going to lift them up. Because your focus isn't on self, your focus is on Jesus. Now a worldly confidence, I mean if you get around someone who's arrogant and they have a worldly confidence, I mean it immediately makes you feel low. It's a sensual, uh, devilish, carnal wisdom that's not born of the kingdom of God and doesn't belong in the church and doesn't belong anywhere in the kingdom. But when a godly confidence is present, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep you confident and not self-focused, and it's also going to lift up those around you, which is God's intention for you. Verse 4, but Let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another, for each one shall bear his own load. Now, this almost sounds like it's contrary, like there's a contradiction that's taking place. It's that we're to bear one another's burdens, and then at the same time, each one has his own load. Um, we are in this together. You know, we are, we are a part of the body of Christ, and you know, I, I've talked a lot about this in times past. You're not called to be alone. You're called to be a part of a family of believers. You're called to do life together. God has always presented His body as a place of community. You need fellowship with other believers. You need people in your life that are believers. You need to spend time. We have, we have brought forth this thing called church um, where we do this, but at, but at the same time, um, how many know that, that being together with other believers is more than just being with people on a Sunday morning? It's having fellowship. It's being around other Christians. It's being around other people that believe like you believe. There's a refreshing, there's a strengthening that takes place there. And so that's a reality. But at the same time, how many know there's also this sense that you have your own race that you're running? How many know when you stand before God and you give an account of your life, you, you're going to stand alone. It's not going to be you uh, with a bunch of other people or it's going to be you giving an account. And so you have your own race. Now, don't let that bring a bunch of um, uh, pressure on you. Don't let that uh, bring a bunch of condemnation upon you. Um, we, you know, there is an element of reward in this thing. God will give you certain graces and certain abilities, and then you use those, those graces and those abilities, and then God rewards you for using the grace that He first gave you. And so there is an element, like Paul spoke, where we have our own race. We have our own individual race. Now, in this race, I'm not running against somebody else. I'm actually just running the race, doing the calling that God gave me to have. And I want to take it a step further no one has a greater race than somebody else. A lot of times you'll take a look at someone that had, like Billy Graham, for example, who has a tremendously public ministry, and, and you know, clearly we can see his calling. And then you have someone else um, who, who, who's been a mother who's raised her children um, you know, in the name of the Lord and raised, raised, you know, raised, you know, raised her children and, and done things quietly where nobody sees and nobody knows. And we think that Billy Graham somehow has a greater race and a greater calling in this this, this person has a lesser calling. It's not true. Uh, there's not greater or lesser. There's just the reality of what God has called you to do, what your race is, and it's just simply walking with the Lord and allowing Him to bring forth in your life. Um, what, it's a partnership. It's really just a yielding. God's the one that does all of it, but God will allow us um, to take the grace that He gave us to glorify His name, to be a blessing, and to help. And so, what this is talking about is that individual responsibility of you fulfilling your call before God. I mean, you know, it's not just the pastors that are called. Can I get an amen? I mean, you know, we're actually all called. Every single one of us. All of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. All of us are called to walk in love. All of us are called um, to shine as a light in our community. So there is an, there is an element of individual calling. There are people who are called into the sports arena. There are people who are called into different types of of businesses and different type of, of secular areas. They're called to be a light where they're at. They don't have a lesser calling than someone who's behind the pulpit. There's different callings. But the bottom line is uh, that there is this, this um, element of we're doing this together, but at the same time, there's an element of you have your own race, and that's what this is talking about. Let each one examine his own work, then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not and another, for each one shall bear his own load. And I'm talking about that individual race, that individual calling that you have. Um, and then he goes on in verse 6, and it says, Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let and let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are the household of faith. Now, this is simply just talking about finances. This is talking about giving in to those that teach you. Um, you know, this is something, this is a re- reoccurring theme um, in Paul's letters. When, when someone uh, takes their life and, and sows into someone else's heart, sows into someone else's life spiritual things, he said, is it a tragedy that we would reap carnal things? What is, what is this talking about? It's just simply talking about um, the partnership between a minister and those that they minister to. As this person ministers, how I many know the minister, in my opinion, should not charge a price? I feel like the gospel should be presented for free, um, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I feel like it should always be presented for free. The Bible says, freely we have received, freely we give. And so when the minister comes, he's giving him his life, he's giving him himself, and it could be in a local church, it could be uh, you know, of, a, of a public ministry, a television ministry, a radio ministry, but he's giving of himself. And so there is this element of partnership with the people where they're going to partner with this minister and give back into his life so that he can take care of his, he or she can take care of their family, take care of the things that they need to take care of, and they can give themselves to the teaching of the word. They can give themselves to the ministry and not be weighed down uh, with the burdens of the, the things of this life as far as like working a secular job as well as a ministry job. Now, there's a different scenario where, where Paul's talking about, you know, he was employed as a tent maker. And so there's no disparaging remarks towards individuals that are in full time ministry. No disparaging remarks towards those who are bivocational, people that are in ministry and also working. There's clear examples of both in Scripture. Um, but it says that he that preaches the gospel should live of the gospel. So there's, there, there's, there's a balance that's there, and it's different for individual people. Different people have different callings. I've been in full-time ministry for probably 14, 15 years. That's what God's called me to do. He said, put your hand to the plow and never look back. And that's what I've been doing. And he's always taken care of me and my family. He's always supplied our needs, and uh, he's always done that. And I trust him for that. But for other people, you know, God may call people to be in, 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 in to be bivocational. I know other people that, that that's what God's called them to do, and they're graced to do that. And I think it's different for different people. The Bible says we get into trouble when we compare ourselves among ourselves. When you compare your life with someone else's life, um, there's some trouble that can happen there. You know, when, when uh, Jesus was talking to Peter, and uh, at, right before, at the end of the book of John, Jesus is talking to Peter and said, okay, this is what you're going to do, this is what you're going to do, this way. And here comes John walking up. And Peter's like, well, what about this guy? What's he going to do? And, and, and Jesus was like, look, don't you be concerned about him. You focus on you. you know, and Jesus said, what is it to you if, if he live until I return? And so they misunderstood what Jesus said, and they all thought John was never going to die. <laughs> But the point being is, you're not called to compare yourself to somebody else. You're not called to compare your life to another. You do what God's called you to do. You be led by the Spirit of God for you. Not saying we can't learn from each other and all of these things, but when we compare, when you compare any type of comparison, and we have to be careful with this with social media, because social media is like where we show all the good parts of our lives, and then we can compare ourselves with other, someone else's life, and then we can either feel bad or we can feel like we're better than, and this is just not wise, okay? When you fall into the trap of comparison, you're setting yourself up either for arrogance or despair. Best thing you can do is what Jesus told Peter, hey Peter, you follow me. <laughs> Amen. And as we do that, um, it's going to be different for everybody. But that's what this passage is talking about. Let him who's taught the word share, that's the word koinonia, in all good things with him who teaches. What is that talking about? It's talking about giving to people who sow into your life. Um, and then it says, Do not be deceived, God's not mocked. For whatever man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will reap everlasting life. What's this talking about? Well, we can take our finances and we can put them towards um, noble things. And I'm talking about things that have an eternal, um, eternal mark in the earth. When you support um, a ministry that is having impact in the earth, that's, that's, that's helping people, changing people's lives, bringing them into a relationship with God, your finances, you're sowing into the Spirit. You're having um, an eternal impact in somebody's life. Now, and then on the flip side of that, um, saying he that sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. Now, um, you know, this is still talking about finances. And, uh, you know, there can be some discrepancy concerning this passage of scripture on what on what exactly what this means. I'm just going to give you my viewpoint. Um, we can take our finances and I mean, you know, I could take all of my money and put it into a car, like all of my money. 
and just, it's all about this car. It's all about this car. I'm going to take all my time, all my money, and put it into this car. Um, how many know as I do that, um, number one, how many know that car can become the most important thing in my life? How many know that your heart will follow your money? It's just true. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever you're putting your money, your heart's going to follow that. And so if I take all of my money, my time, and my energy, and I put it into this car, how many know that car can become more important to me than God? How many know that car can become more important to me than the kingdom, become more important to me than my family, can be more important to me than anything? And all of a sudden, this car can become an idol because it's number one in my life. Now, how many know an idol cannot bring you life or give you life? The thing about an idol is you've got to carry it because it can't carry you. Um, idols don't have the ability to help you or to save you. Idols only burden you and, bear, and, and, and weigh you down. And so when I take something and I take all of, you know, how many of your finances actually can represent your life? It's the closest thing we have to, uh, to a physical sacrifice is our finance because it represents our time. It's all of our time, all of our energy. So if I take all of this money and I put it number one in this car, how many know that, that that can really bring a sense of corruption into my life? How many know that car is not going to bring me life? How many know that car can become an idol, can become number one? And how many know that that car has no eternal significance? How many know eventually that car will rust in the ground? Or I can take, now, nothing wrong with putting money in your car, nothing wrong with spending money on things in the earth. All, there's got to be balance here. But I mean, you know, I can take my finances and I can put it into the kingdom and it can reap something that is an eternal reward rather than something that's temporal. Y'all tracking me here? See, this, type of, this isn't the type of scripture we like to teach. At least not me as a pastor. But this is the beauty of, of expository teaching. You have to teach it because it's right here in the book. And, um, but, but anyway, my point being is this. I can sow into carnal things. I can spend all my money into carnal things and talk about things of this life, things of this world. Nothing wrong with these things. But if I take all of my finances and that's my only investment, these things are not going to bring forth everlasting life. These things are not going to bring forth eternal significance. Okay. Now, please understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying take all of your money and put it into the kingdom and don't take care of your family and don't take care of your car and don't take care of your life. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that. I mean, you know, there are people that do say that. And that's dumb and that's wrong. And it's called extortion. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, and many of us, and we may have even come from an extortionistic type of background where we were guilted into giving and condemned into giving, so even hearing this type of teaching can make you feel kind of, oh. But there is a balance, and there is a right way to do this. And it's simply this. You, just, you are led by the Spirit of God in what you give, and understand that there is an element of responsibility to the hearer to partnership and give back into the person that's preaching. Because how many know that we want them to be able to take care of their families, to be able to take care of their lives, and let them live a comfortable life in the earth rather than living in a state of struggle? It's a simple partnership. And when it's done in a healthy fashion, it's a beautiful thing because someone stands forth, they pour out of their life, and then there's a reciprocation. Everybody's taken care of, care of and uh, the body's a, a healthy thing. It's a beautiful thing. And the Spirit of God will be the one who leads you what to give. The Bible says that He gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. God will bring into your life provision through the gifts that He's given you, uh, through the abilities He's given you. You, know, you work your job, you make your paycheck, all of these things. And there's a portion of that that you eat and you enjoy. And then there's a portion of that that God will deem as seed that you take and you bless. You become a person that is a blessing in someone else's life. Now, how many know you do not have to sow that seed? You can eat that seed. You don't have to sow it. God's still going to love you. God's still going to bless you. God's still going to be for you. But how many know eaten seed does not produce the same as planted seed? Planted seed produces, eaten seed does not. You know, we got a garden out here, and this garden produced so much this year. Like, well, I'm excited about the pumpkins that are out there. We got some big pumpkins out there, which would be cool. This is the first year we got big pumpkins. This will be really fun. But my point being is we would not have that garden had we not sown seed. If we'd have brought those little packets in and we all sit down and we just ate those little seeds, which we could do that. Yeah, no, you wouldn't have. You wouldn't have. And, uh, but it would not have brought forth because it was not sown. Seed time and harvest is something that God has placed in the earth. Everything operates on seed time and harvest. Everything does. So 
There's a portion that God gives you that's yours. There's a portion that God gives you that's, that is to sow into somebody else's life. And specifically, in this context of Scripture, it's someone who's pouring their heart out in ministry. Um, so anyway, so moving forward. And so, um, verse 9, And it said, Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And so here, here's, here's the aspect of there can be a weariness in giving. There can be, you know, and it's really important when you're looking at your giving not to look at it as a bill that you're paying. It's important to understand that. If you look at it as a bill that you're paying, it can very much grow weary. But when you're giving, you have to understand you're honoring God, you're being a blessing in the kingdom, um, and it's more than just paying a light bill or, or paying a telephone bill. And, but what he says here, let us not grow weary in well-doing. What does that mean? That means there is an opportunity to grow weary in well-doing. There's an opportunity to grow weary in giving. You think, well, my goodness, I'm just flushing this down the toilet. Uh, nothing good is coming of this. What, you know, what I need to do is I need to take all of this that I'm giving to other people, not just in a ministry setting, but giving, period, and I need to keep it all for myself. <laughs> I need to eat it all. I need to keep it all because if I take everything and I keep it, then I'm going to be happier and my life's going to be better. I mean, we just talked about that earlier. I mean, that's not how things operate. I mean, that's selfishness and that's fear-based. And that's not trusting God as your supply. That's trusting you as your supply. God invites all of us to be taken by the hand and to learn how to be givers. You don't have to. But people that live for something other than themselves are happier than people that live in a state of selfishness and stay in a state of being a consumer. And so it says in verse 9, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. What does that mean? As you're casting your bread upon the water, as you're giving, God will bring it back into your life. I now really enjoy being a giver. I really enjoyed being liberal in my giving. It's a part of my life. It's a part of who I am. And it's fun. But in the past, when I was under that old system, of condemnation and guilt, I hated giving. In fact, I got to a place where I was not going to give anything to anybody. And if one, pre- one more preacher tried to ask me for money, um, I, you know what I'm saying? Like I was in that season for a long time because it had been so abused. This is an area in the body of Christ that's been tremendously abused. I mean, it's almost embarrassing sometimes to watch Christian television and see people beg for money and see people, all they talk about is money. And I'm not trying to be cast a disparaging light on ministries that are, you know, are, are raised up to teach on the financial end of, of the Bible and things of that nature. Jesus taught more about money than he did anything else in his parables. But what I am saying is, how I many know that this area has been tremendously abused? And it's unfortunate. And so now it's like when you're a preacher and you're teaching on this, you almost feel apologetic about it because it's been so abused. But you know, if there's an area where there's been abuse and damage, how I many know that's the area that you actually need teaching on? Because that's the area where the most abuse has happened, you know. Um, but in the same light, who do you think is the author of this being abused? Well, the enemy is. He does not want there to be healthy giving in the body of Christ. He wants people not to trust preachers. He wants people not to trust leadership. And as a result, stop the gospel uh, from going forth so that people can experience what Jesus paid for on the cross. Um, so anyway, verse 9, And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore... As we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Now, this, this takes us out of the context of the church and brings us over into giving, not just to people that are ministering to you, but giving to everyone, you know, everyone that God calls you to give to. It, let us do good to all. What does that mean? That means that God is going to have certain seed for you to sow into other people's lives, into people that need help, you know, into um, the, God wants you to learn how to be a giver, learn how to be a blessing to those around you. So it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. But then he goes back to the, to the church and says, especially to those who are the household of faith. Once again, talking about the context of giving where it has been given to you. Now, verse 11. See, because we're going to get because we're going to get through this. Amen. See, see with what see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may, may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. 
For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So now he starts going back to the original intent and the theme of this entire letter, which is salvation is a result of believing. Salvation is by grace, through faith, and no other way. And he starts addressing, once again, this issue of circumcision. So uh, with that context, let me start to break it down. Verse 11, see with what letters, large letters, I've written to you with my own hand. What's he talking about? Many times these guys would use scribes. Many times that they would have people that would help them uh, to write the letter. And uh, in this particular circumstance, he's saying, I wrote this thing myself. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. So what this is talking about is, uh, once again, uh, the legalists, the Judaizers, had infiltrated the Galatian church, and they were wanting people to not only trust in Jesus, but also to trust in the old Mosaic laws of circumcision. He's saying they, had, they want to make a good showing, but they want to do it in the flesh and not according to Christ. And this is something that we've looked at many times in times past. And he's saying salvation is not based on something that is external. How many know that you don't have to be circumcised in order to get to heaven? Amen. In their time period, it was a huge issue because they were still coming out of the old system of the Mosaic law. And these Judaizers would come up and say, look, it's great that you trust in Jesus. It's great that you're a believer, but you've also got to be circumcised if you want to be saved. Now, how I many you know today we know that that's not true and that's a little easier for us to swallow, but then there's all these other sets of rules and regulations that have arisen. There are those that think that I would not get, get to heaven because of the length of my hair. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've been, uh, you know, prejudiced against or judged as a result of the length of my hair. Well, this guy, you know, and it's in reference to a passage of scripture in Corinthians, and if you look at what he's actually talking about, he's talking about a man trying to look like a woman. It's not talking about the actual length of hair. But, but people would look at something on the outside or look at a woman wearing pants. Say, look at this woman. She's you know, trying to, you know, she can't get into heaven you know, if she's going to wear pants or you can't get into heaven if you're going to have a tattoo or you can't get into heaven if you're going to have your ear pierced or your nose pierced or your navel pierced or whatever. And the bottom line and really the underlying theme of this entire book of Galatians is salvation is not based on something external that we do. Salvation is based on Jesus Christ and belief in Jesus as Savior. And that is the bottom line. And so, uh, once again, he's going back to and he's addressing um, this, this concept that he originally wrote this letter for. And so, verse 13, he says, um, and he's talking about they, a fair showing in the flesh. In other words, they're wanting to look good outwardly. They're wanting to look good and draw attention to themselves. Verse 13, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. So here, here's the reality, and Paul brought this forth in the book of Romans. I mean, you know, none of the Jewish people were keeping the law perfectly. In fact, no one ever had. The only person that could keep the law was Jesus Christ. Jesus, born of a virgin, lived 33 and a half years under the law of Moses, and when he step to the foot of the cross, he could step to the law and say, I kept this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. He kept the entire law and fulfilled the law, laid it aside and said, now I will become the sacrifice for everyone that had fallen short of the glory of God, everyone that couldn't fulfill the law. I will become the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I am the sacrifice. I will take all sin unto myself. And now this law that man has been living under for thousands of years will be fulfilled. The old covenant will be laid to a side. And now this new covenant is based on my finished work on the cross. And it's based on what I did, not what man can do. Can I get an amen? Salvation is not a uh, self-help scheme. Salvation is not uh, who can be better or do more or keep more laws. The law proved that all man failed, brought forth an equality in the sense of guilt towards the whole world. So now we can now, the law became our schoolmaster. So now that we can come to Jesus and say, you know what? I need a savior. I need help. Amen. And so Paul is addressing the same concept. He said, all these Jews that are trying to bring in the law, he said, they're not keeping the law. And if you, if you look in legalism, legalism hides behind a pointed finger. Where legalism is present, where, where condemnation is present, people are trying to act like they're so holy and they're doing this right and they're doing that right and they're so awesome. Gener Paul said, you that command people not to steal, do you steal? 
You that command people not to do this, do you do that? Why? Because the nature of the law is this. It brings this sense of accusation and condemnation where I'm going to judge what's going on in your life and I'm going to hide behind this pointed finger because i got 15 skeletons in my own closet, but I can't see those or pay attention to those because I'm too busy condemning you. And I hide myself from my own flesh and I seem so self-righteous and holy and awesome when in reality I'm probably doing 15 times worse than what you're doing. But I'm not, my, my focus isn't on me, my focus is on you and how bad you are. The easiest place to hide is behind a pointed finger. And Paul addressed that at the beginning of the book of Romans. He says, you that tell people not to steal, do you steal? What is he saying? He's saying this, man can't keep the law. Nobody can, nobody ever could, nobody ever will. The purpose of the law was a mirror to show you your dirtiness. It did not have the ability to cleanse you. It could only show you what was wrong with you. It was your schoolmaster to bring you to Jesus. Amen? And so, and so he says here, uh, for, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law. I said, nobody can keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. And the issue was this. It was this prideful thing of, well, how many Gentiles did you get to be circumcised this week? Well, I got three. And so, you know, these guys are out here. It's, it's such a weird thing. It's like a really weird thing. Like, if you think about the dynamics of it, I mean, can you imagine what it was like using the restroom around these guys? I mean, I hate to say that, but I mean, it was like a thing. Like, Johnny's not circumcised. <laughs> Johnny's not going to heaven. We got to go get Johnny and make sure he knows he's got to be circumcised. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. I mean, we read this in Scripture. We don't realize how weird all this probably was, all right? There's a lot of things that happened before this, like eating pork and all that. Oh, yeah. All that stuff. All that stuff. <laughs> and so, but what was, the, what was the, the end game here was boasting in self. Boasting in how, well, I got this many people to do this, and I got this many people to do that. Like, how many know if there was a minister that managed to come to me and talk me into cutting my hair off, and then, how many know he could brag to his friends that, look, man, we finally got this preacher sanctified. He is finally going to heaven. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it would be an issue of pride. It really wouldn't be an issue of caring about me. It'd be an issue of looking good in front of his friends. You follow me? This is the nature of legalism. It looks good outwardly, but inwardly it's full of dead man's bones. And so, um, certain that they may boast in your flesh. Verse 14, we're closing. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And Paul's saying, look, my only boast is this. My boast is in Jesus. Don't brag about what I've done good. I don't brag about what I've done bad. My boast is in Jesus. My confidence is in Jesus. My confidence is in the cross. And how many know the, <laughs> the cross is foolishness to those that, that do not believe, but for us it is the very power of God that our Savior did not come down and rescue us through military might. Our Savior came down, laid down His life, and rescued us from the things that were destroying us as a result of Him taking it unto Himself. And they always thought the Messiah was going to be a military master like David, but they did not know that He was going to come as a lamb. And He was going to set us free through yielding and surrendering, not through conquering. But He did conquer sin on the cross. And Paul says this, This is my boast. My boast is in the cross my boast is in Jesus. And he goes on to say, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And what is he saying? He's saying, you know what? All this stuff that means so much to everybody else, all of these things that people are putting their confidence in, all these things that people are putting their stock in, my confidence isn't in these things. My confidence is in Jesus. Amen? Verse 15, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. So how many know? He said, it's not what is outward. It's not the presence of foreskin or the absence of foreskin. The presence of a whole lot of hair, the absence of a whole lot of hair. Slacks, not slacks, all of these things. It's not about external things. It's about a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. I used to be a sinner. I used to be an atheist. I used to be anti-God. God came into my life. He rescued me from the hell that I created on this world. And as a result of that, I became a new creation in Christ Jesus. It's not about what's outward in my appearance. It's about what's taking place in my heart. Amen. See, Christianity shouldn't just be this cultural thing where, where it's all you know, based on the way someone looks outwardly. How I many you know we can have Christians of all walks of life, of all looking different outwardly, because it's not about what's on the outside, it's what is on the inside, the new creation. Now, the thing that should be common 
amongst believers is the fruit of the Spirit. Love, peace, joy, kindness, gentleness. And that can come in a million different packages, but the character of Christ is what counts, not all of these uh, regulations written by man's codes and rules. Verse 16, For as many as walk according to this rule, what rule? The rule of a new creation in Christ. Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. So this is our standard. What? That we are now new creations in Christ. We are now the righteousness of God. Nothing else. Verse 17, From now on let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now, um, people, there's some discrepancy on what this means. Um, In my opinion, it's in reference to all of the stuff that he went through. Uh, He was stoned to death. Um, he was, you know, he was attacked. He was attacked by wild animals. He was constant. People were always trying to kill Paul because he had good news. <laughs> and uh, as a result of that, um, he went through a lot of different stuff. And so I think he's referencing the things that he went through physically as a result of preaching the gospel. There's some people who think that he might be talking about, um, uh, I forget the name of it, charismata or something like that, um, in reference to. Uh, Stuff that I don't understand or even agree with. So <laughs> y'all, if y'all do your own homework on that, uh, that's what I think he's talking about. But you know, anytime you present the truth, you present what you understand. And we're all learning and nobody's an expert in this thing. Verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And then he closes it. Amen. And he, and he ends with the grace of God. He begins with the grace of God. He ends with the grace of God. And um, amen. The whole book, is basically trying to keep us out of a state of legalism. Legalism's always trying to frustrate grace, always trying to attack the church, always trying to attack your own life. Why is that? Because in legalism, you are the loser. Yeah. <laughs> you lose. Why? Well, because if we measure you by you, you don't measure up. I don't measure up. And the enemy always wants to bring you out of a state of grace and bring you into the balances of legalism and of judgment. And in that place, you'll either think that you're so awesome that you're better than everybody else, and then pride forms in your life, and grace is frustrated, and love's not flowing through you, or you will feel so despondent and so depressed and so bad because you're so horrible and you don't measure up that you'll, you'll live in two states of self-focus. One in pride and arrogance and self-focus, the other in depression and oppression and self-focus. <clears throat> and the reality is, you're not called to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're called to eat from the tree of life. Don't put your focus on you. The good things you do or the bad things you do. Put your focus on Jesus Christ. Put it on Him. As many as walk according to this rule, the rule of the new creation. According to Scripture and the finished work of the cross, your sins and lawless deeds He remembers no more. You've been given an eternal forgiveness. Um, You are now under a new covenant. And you're no longer walking under the law, the Mosaic law for your justification. You are now made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now the Spirit of God has been shed abroad in your heart to deposit the love of God, to deposit the Spirit of God to where now you can, by being loved and loving, being led by the Spirit, You can fulfill the law and go way past the law, not through your strength or your willpower, but through God's strength and God's grace and God's ability. How many know that by the Spirit, God will not only not lead you to commit adultery, but how many know God will teach you how to love your spouse? Can I get an amen? Not only will God teach you not to take His name in vain, but God will teach you how to pray. Not only will God teach you not to murder your brother, God will teach you how to, to have forgiveness and how to have love. Not only will God teach you not to steal, God will lead you to be a giver rather than a taker. And so under the new covenant, there's not an absence of law in the sense that's lawlessness, but under the new covenant, the Spirit of God writes His laws upon your heart and upon your mind. You become a New Testament Christian that's not scrambling for acceptance and approval. You're sitting down, enjoying acceptance, enjoying love, enjoying approval, and thereby being a spirit-led child of God, not living under that spirit of orphan, that spirit of fear of bondage. Amen? And so now, we will, now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna begin a, a new series, and we're going to really take a look at the Spirit of God and the role that the Spirit of God plays in the New Covenant, and also the role of grace and faith together. And this has been brewing in my heart for weeks, and I've been looking forward to teaching it, but I felt like we needed to get through the book of Galatians first, so... 
Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, if you need to give an offering this morning, lift your hand up. We'll get one to you.